All right, well, we are here this week and next. We're actually gonna do a two-part uh, segment here for Boundless uh, for our culture segment. We are on the property where The Chosen uh, is filmed. I am here sitting with Jerry Jenkins and Dallas Jenkins. They are related, uh, father and son. And uh, Dallas, as many of you know, you know, you guys, uh, we have been seeding this on social. We've been talking about this. We found out that um, half of you guys, our Boundless listeners, have seen season one of The Chosen and are excited uh, about having seen it. 50% of you know, what are you doing? I mean, for crying out loud, we've been in quarantine for a year. Yeah. What have you been doing with your time? So um, we're going to have a fun conversation today with these two because Dallas... Um, writer, director, creator of The Chosen series, which is the like largest crowdfunded project that's been put out there. Um, super cool. Also, I mean, uh, writer, director, you've done other projects as well. Um, and Jerry, his dad, known, um, very much known for the Left Behind series. I mean, I think we all can say that, but actually, um, New York Times, uh, best-selling author, 21 times over, nearly 200 um, books contributed to my goodness um, that have sold over 72 million copies um, i have written one book jerry um, it has not yet sold 72 million copies i'm getting there so just give me time okay um, but we're gonna have a fun time talking today about the chosen the series and now the book a fictionalized account of what has happened a lot of people are going to see that uh, through season one, um, those who have seen the show, and just get to know you guys a little bit as well. So welcome to The Boundless Show. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, this is fun, uh, you know, fun to have you here. So, okay, um, Jerry, I just started out by saying the vast number of books um, that you have written, contributed to, uh, including over 20 biographies. And before we started taping, I talked to you that your most significant one is with Bill Gaither, which my fans know. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Um, I actually interviewed him for the show. Um, I was super weird in the process. He was very gracious. He didn't call security. <laughs> it's all good. Um, but uh, you're most known uh, probably for your Left Behind series written with Tim LaHaye. Um, talk to us a little bit about, because here we are, we're an audience of many young adults who are kind of trying to get their footing, figure out you know, what they're doing with their lives and stuff like that. Talk to us about life uh, before Left Behind. I know you were a writer. I know you long, you know, had decided that you were going to be a writer, editor. Talk to us about that. And then the decision to write the Left Behind series and kind of where that took you from there. Yeah, I was uh, a full-time writer, um, full-time freelance writer for, since about the early 90s. And uh, I had written 125 or 124 books at that time, I think it was. And uh, my agent called one day and asked me if I knew Tim LaHaye. And I had never met Tim, but of course I was aware of him. Everybody was. He was a best-selling nonfiction writer. And uh, my agent said, you know, he's a nonfiction bestseller who has a great fiction idea. And you're a novelist with no ideas. So mm -hmm. we want to get you two together. <laughs> we, uh, we met and we really hit it off. He was the same age as my parents. And, and uh, in fact, he's passed by now. He died on Dallas's birthday about three years ago. And, uh, but he, you know, he was such a, a wonderful man of God and, and uh, such a, a dramatic witness. You know, whenever we were together, he would share his faith with somebody. Mm -hmm. But I loved the idea that he had. He'd, he said he'd been coming home from a um, prophecy conference. He taught about the rapture for decades. Uh, after he was a pastor, he spoke all over the country and wrote all these nonfiction books. And he said um, his books about the end times he thought were good and, and interesting. And, of course, they espoused his, his uh, unique view of it. And, which I happen to share, even though I'm not a theologian or a scholar. And uh, he said he was on an airplane, and he, and he saw a, a flight attendant flirting with the pilot. And he noticed that the pilot had a wedding ring on, and, and the flight attendant didn't. And uh, he just started thinking, you know, what would happen if these two have a relationship or, or are thinking about one? Um, and maybe he's got a wife at home who's a believer in Christ and who's been telling him about the rapture. And the rapture happens right then. And a third of the people on the plane disappear right out of their clothes. And uh, 
And then he knows when he gets home, his wife's going to be missing too. And that's what he had. That was it. That was the basic you know, germ of the idea. I love the idea. And um, so as we talked it through, I just, you know, I was assigned to write a, a first chapter and, and see how this might play out. And um, our agent shopped it to, to several publishers. About half of them said, why would anybody buy a book when you know the ending? <laughs> and, and the other half w were interested, in, and a couple of them were very interested, in, and Tyndale got the, the deal. But that's how that came about. It was Dr. LaHaye's idea. And one thing that appealed to me about it was, uh, I don't think fiction can be co-written. There are people that can do it. I'm not one of them. And um, so this, this was going to be where it was his idea. He would be the theological expert, keep me on track biblically, mm -hmm. but I'd get the fun part, make okay. up the story and write mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought it was going to be one big book to tell the, the rapture, the, the seven years of tribulation, the, the glorious appearing. Um, I got about halfway through the writing of that book, and I had covered about two weeks of the seven years. <laughs> And so I said to Dr. LaHaye and to Tyndale, uh, this is going to have to be more than one book. And they said, okay, make it three. So halfway through the second book, I was, I'd only been a couple months into the deal. So um, they said, all right, just keep writing it at the same pace. They liked what they were seeing, and they said, let it tell itself out. And it eventually became 16 titles in that adult series. And uh, it's hard to believe the first title in that series came out in 1995. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, oh, it's still selling today. The <laughs> okay. Whole thing, yeah. Man. Okay, Dallas, tell us from your perspective, because clearly the first book sells, subsequent books sell, becomes a bestseller, bazillion copies mm -hmm. now. What was it like from your perspective growing up in a home where now your dad is like this famous writer and he's all like, everyone's all calling him like, mm -hmm. hey, Jerry, can you come and do this? Mm -hmm. or, we want you to write X, Y, Z just tell your feelings about that growing up because you were kind of a young adultish. I was in college when yeah. when the first Left Behind book came out okay. and what's funny the first year or so uh, it wasn't a huge seller it was just kind of gating like people seemed to like it when they read it but I remember I would go into bookstores and mm -hmm. and see that there was a couple copies there and then I started to go into bookstores and they'd be gone because they were sold out and starting to notice that and then noticing that my my some of my friends or I would overhear conversations about the book at college and that's when I thought well that's really interesting college students are reading it now and excited about it and just watching it grow and grow and grow uh, started off slowly then it started to accelerate and you're thinking it's reached its peak but then it just kept building and building and building um, so that was really interesting for me um, I think one of the cool things about it was from a personal level Having the opportunity to read the books was cool because I would read them before they were even printed. Mm -hmm. um, but also seeing him, seeing my dad experience this and how um, you'd think that it might change him in a way that was, you know, now that he's escalated in his career and has achieved more notoriety and more success, um, that it might uh, create maybe a sense of entitlement or you've seen it a lot where people get more and more famous and then maybe they change. And uh, I actually saw, in many ways, the opposite, which mm -hmm. I saw more humility and more mm -hmm. um, kind of a, kind of a clearly this is not my doing. Clearly, I'm on a ride that God is, has orchestrated that I'm just lucky to be part of, which was a great, I think, uh, example for me as to what's now happening with The Chosen mm -hmm. to see firsthand how it happened 25 years ago. Yeah. So I think, isn't this year or last year, 2020 was the 25th anniversary right. of, of the Left Behind book. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was fascinating. I was at the, I, at the time wanting to get into film. I actually um, went to work for the company that produced the first Left Behind movie hmm. um, and started just out as a secretary and kind of worked my way up uh, for a few years there. And then we started our own production company. So there was a certainly there was a personal connection to it, a personal perspective, a uh, just an artistic one of just enjoying reading them, mm -hmm. and then a career one where, in many ways, those books. Uh, not only took his career to the next level, but in some ways they helped launch mine. Because mm -hmm. when I graduated from college, I had this job at this production company, and uh, and it also the success of the books, books allowed us to have the means to start our own company as well. Yeah, I think now. Well, clearly, Jerry, now that you know the novelization of the Chosen is out, you're going to get all weird on YouTube and Instagram and try to become one of these Justin Bieber influencers. <laughs> I know. So this is you know, watch yourself. Okay, yeah. watch. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll see how you do. Okay, Dallas, tell us though, what did you learn specifically from him about storytelling and creativity? What would you say you observed? Well, I was you know, raised not only in an environment where he was a writer, but he was also a, a storyteller just in general. He was always the funniest guy in the room. When we'd have people over, I was always seeing him kind of hold court and making people laugh. So I think that's where I was as, as influenced as anything. I'm actually not, I mean, I'm a writer in the sense that I help write the scripts, but um, we're, we're, we're actually pretty different when it comes to our approach to writing. Mm-hmm. Um, he has the discipline to write, to write an entire book from scratch. Mm-hmm. I could never do that. Um, and so we, we just, we, we, we always had different approaches and different skill sets. Um, I think one of the biggest things was is when he introduced me to movies when I was uh, in, in middle school. Hmm. Um, he's a big movie buff and started, you know, at first when I was when I was young, um, we we had a pretty strict environment in terms of you know the movies we watched were PG or G and and all family friendly and whatnot. When I got into middle school and high school, old enough to start seeing more mature movies, um, he started introducing me to some of the great movies of all time and. And uh, and that was that was a huge influence. And and I was I would ask him questions about how you know how did they do that and why did they make that choice. And so he just has a really great understanding of storytelling, yeah. even though our specific styles are different. Yeah. The ob, the ob, the the obvious overall approach of a beginning, a middle, and an end, and and uh, you know figuring out what the twists and turns are and how that applies to some of the great movies that he loves and mm-hmm. some of the great books that he loves. So mm-hmm. uh, it was just an environment of, of, sto- of, of story that yeah. I was just immersed in. Well, let's talk a little bit about the stories within The Chosen uh, sure. in particular, because many people have tried, some have succeeded, some have failed to recount aspects of the life of Christ, the Gospels, biblical series, whatever. Um, you know, and, and done so, like I said, with, with varying success. What makes The Chosen different, would you say? Like, what's been kind of your, why did you feel this retelling needed to happen? And then especially, Jerry, in the novelization of it and putting it to print, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, someone's going to be like, um, hello, I read it in the Bible. Like, what? You know, right. <laughs> so talk to us about, let's start first with the series, Dallas. Yeah, so another thing that I think influenced me growing up was, um, when we would go to church and I, I would have Sunday school, hearing the, the stories of Jesus, we would do devotional books together as a family sometimes. Um, my dad is, is actually quite outside the box when it comes to um, joking around and, and, and thinking of things that maybe aren't on the page. So, excuse me, we would, so we would read a, a, a Bible story and he would say things like, could you imagine what it must have been like to sit there and or be, have the disciples sitting around the campfire at night? What would they have talked about? And we would start making jokes. And and I, I always had this skewed perspective um, on some of the famous stories of the Bible. Is We would always want to go a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. And I think he's a very curious uh, person, and I'm very curious about, all right, this story is interesting, but where, where, where else can we go with it? And what are, what's some of the context? So The Chosen came from a place of truly wanting to explore um, the stories that I've heard hundreds and hundreds of times, but only heard them on a surface level. So there's spiritual truths, of course, in all these stories, but from a humanity perspective, it's always very surface. And the stories, when you look in the scriptures, are actually quite short. They're just a couple of verses. Mm-hmm. And so looking for the, the the meat in between the stories, the context, the biblical and historical context, all that went into the desire to tell this story and go, all right, I've heard these stories hundreds of times. I believe in them. I don't want to change anything about them. I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. I believe that this Bible is God's word. I don't. There's no reason to improve upon it. But from a TV show perspective, perhaps we can dig in a little deeper and uh, explore the backstories of these people. And what's it like? We know that Simon Peter had a wife because he had a mother-in-law. What must that have been like? What you know? No, from what we can glean of Simon Peter's personality, what what would he be like as a husband? Let's explore that. And um, because we have the safety net of the fact that we both love the Bible. Um, and I was raised as a as a lover of God's word and as a, a, a strong Christian. Um, there was never any risk of of trying to rewrite anything or come at it from a different angle or try to um, what would what it would have been like if Jesus wasn't actually the Messiah. None of that. Mm-hmm. This was a what would it have been like from a human perspective to be a follower of Christ or to be a rejecter of Christ. And I think the show was set up in that way, and then the novel allows 
us to go even a little bit deeper because we're able to get inside their thoughts, mm -hmm. which you can't do in a show. Yeah. So I think we both just have that perspective of wanting to explore things and see what happens. Yeah. So Jerry, talk about getting into their thoughts on the page because, you know, what's so great about doing this interview for Boundless is that these guys, like these disciples, were young guys. They were young adults. They would it's have a been myth to think that they were in their 40s and that you yeah. typically see them portrayed as these bearded... It's because of those beards. Yeah, you yeah. Know? but, those but yeah, they, were, they were probably in their early 20s, late teens. Yeah, you know, we know Jesus, you know, at the start of his ministry, had just turned 30, which, you know, 30 is the new 20 mm -hmm. um, here for mm -hmm. us today. But, but I mean, they, today, these guys would have been like... Just trying to get their lives together they would have maybe been you know playing some pickup basketball doing some gaming on the side trying to you know get a date maybe on friday night so what did you like jerry about being able to explore the characters in the book and being able to go a little bit beyond just the accounts that were given in scripture and yeah, that is the fun of it and i had actually done this um in my own novel writing before dallas even thought of the the chosen in fact people have asked me if because uh, I did a series with Dr. LaHaye after Left Behind called The Jesus Chronicles, where we did novels based on the four Gospels and did a lot of this, where it was, you know, who brought the fish and the loaves to Jesus? Would would this kid have had a name, obviously? What did his mother tell him? What You know, how did that happen? So we're fleshing out that, that kind of story. And people have said, you know, did, did that influence Dallas? And I said, well, the irony is those books put him through college, but I don't think he read them. <laughs> so, you know, he had the same sensibility and the same idea, and maybe based on some of the stuff we talked about when, when he was a kid. But that is the fun of it. It's it's going deeper and, and saying, and, and I love the fact that, uh, you know, a verse just simply says, um, you know, this or that happened, and then this or that happened, and you go, Boy, that's there's three chapters to a novelist, mm -hmm. and if you just play with it and say, what could it have looked like? Readers will give you that leeway. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you put something, and I remember putting something in one of the Jesus Chronicle books where they're sitting around the fire after the day, and they, they're asking him about the parables, and Jesus smacks a bug on his neck, and pulls it down. He's got this smash bug in his palm, and he just brings it back to life, and it flies off. And people go, where is that in the Bible? I want, you know, well, it's not in the Bible. If it was, it would be a very famous <laughs> scene. But why not? He created everything. Mm -hmm. Could he not, you know, just say, well, I didn't want it to bite me, but I didn't either want to kill it. So let's, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really fun. And and the other thing about, you know, being a novelist is that you get to be the characters. Mm -hmm. So I can be a young boy. I can be an old woman. I can be, you know, whoever. Uh, it's really hard to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you're careful with what he says. It has to line up with scripture. Don't take any liberties there. Mm -hmm. But I too love the idea that, um, you know, I, I've seen the, all the paintings of the, the apostles and they're, you know, they're standing on rocks and they're holding their tunics and they're, you know, they're, they look old and everything. And now when I read scripture, I'm seeing the characters in The Chosen, just like everybody else is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, I'm feeling my way with this fiction, too. I mean, it's a privilege to be able to do a, a novel for each, each season. Um, my initial emphasis was to make sure that it's exactly what you see on screen. Um, and I think I felt a little trepidation about how far do I want to take the creativity of Dallas and his writing team. Um, and I've been assured that I can go deeper and wider with that, which is really going to make the rest of the books in this series fun, too. Yeah. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask on behalf of my audience what I'm sure you guys have been asked before. And that is for both the book and the series, um, toughest scene to write or film to just pull together to make this happen and to feel like you're really capturing what went on and then personal favorite and it can be the same it can be different hmm. whatever so if you're you're picking for yourself alone not creatively not for marketing not for anything just your heart where are we at with that yeah i think the toughest one um might also be my favorite um and maybe i don't know if there's a reason for that but uh we have in episode four the miracle of the fish when uh simon has been up all night and he's been desperate and one of the things we really loved about that is, is, you know, in the Bible, it just says he was up all night, didn't catch anything, and Jesus came along and, and did this miracle where he caught a whole host of fish. And 
creating the backstory of that was really cool, that showing the desperation of Simon Peter and how oppressed he was by the Romans and how high the taxes were, all the things that are true, mm-hmm. um, and how he needed to, he needed those fish. He mm-hmm. needed to catch fish to keep for his livelihood. And uh, he spent all night, you know, uh, going for it. Well, the next morning when, we, when we're filming the scene where uh, Jesus shows up and has him cast the net on the other side of the boat, um, about four days before we were set to film that scene, we didn't have a boat, we didn't have a lake, and we didn't have any fish. Uh, and that spot of desperation actually felt quite similar to where I think Simon might might have been. And uh, because of how The Chosen has gone, and because The Chosen was in many ways birthed out of my own personal career failure, um, I was on this track spiritually of just being open to whatever God had. And I'm like, it's not my job to feed the 5,000, it's only my job to provide the loaves and fish. In this case, we don't even have fish. Uh, we just have loaves. I'm just trying to do what I can. And how that scene came together and how we, I mean, I just remember sitting there, st- standing in the water um, with this net, and we've put this big, what we called a green burrito, which was this green tarp filled with green water balloons so that we could replace them with fish later. And I was just so out of control, meaning I, the, the success of the scene wasn't fully in my hands. It was in the hands of my visual effects guys, and it was in the hands of, of the weather and um, all of that, all, how it all came together just at the, at the literally the last second and turned out to be what I think is one of the most, if not the most inspirational and fun and exciting scenes in the, in the show. And the music of it, I remember, was so much different than what I envisioned because my composers came up with something brilliant. So again, it's a scene that I watch going, yeah, I wrote that but i'm not responsible for how great it turned out and yeah. that was that was really cool. so i think it's both my most challenging and my and my favorite it's a good one all right jerry i have two um i found the uh one of the most inspiring scenes to write was the nativity scene in the pilot section yeah because um, the, the the chosen was birthed from this short film i did about the birth of christ just that was just for my church yep. just for my church's christmas eve service okay right. and, and the that, book actually opens yeah, with that then, right yeah, yeah. And I had uh, written a play for our church years ago about a young shepherd who asks an old shepherd who had been at the nativity to tell about that night. And it's just a monologue of him telling that. And um, so that you know took me back to that. But to imagine somebody, you know, when, when God had not spoken to his people for 400 years, they still all talked about someday there will be a Messiah who comes and rescues us. And then to have these lowly shepherds have this announced to them, it, it moved me. You know, that's one thing I, in writing this novel, I had to watch, I say had to, but I, I had to watch every episode. Uh, and I counted them 22 times. I never grew tired of one scene. And, and I loved the nativity scene. It was, it, and it didn't, it didn't take a whole lot of creativity for me because the, these guys had done a brilliant job with it. But that was a wonderful one. But the, the, my favorite is the one where Jesus talks to, to Mary Magdalene and calls her by name. Yeah. That's when I knew we had the title. Mm-hmm. I have called you by name. Yeah. He's called me by name. Yeah. That's what reaches me. Yeah. Well, okay, and we're going to get into that. Uh, Dallas, you alluded to failure. We're going to get into that next week. Jerry, that scene uh, with Mary... Uh, Lilith turned Mary. We're going to get into that. And so will you guys uh, hop back uh, for next week's show and we'll continue the conversation? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right.